Cool. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to How to Write Rust Instead of C and Get Away with It. Um, so Antonio and I are both are software engineers at Yelp, and we're here today to guide you through it. Um, so first of all, uh, we work for Yelp. Yelp's mission basically is connecting people with very global businesses. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, so first, why are we here? Um, so Yelp is mostly a Python shop. So you, know, you can imagine like a user visiting the Yelp website, um, hitting some Python code. And our use case today would be data serialization. Um, so we rely a lot on the, the format called Avro, Apache Avro. Um, you can think JSON, but binary with schemas. Um, so you have your user um, hitting some Python code. We do need to do data serialization in Avro using the like, official Avro library written in Python. Um, then we get back the data, magic happens, and you get like great reviews for great local businesses. Um, so very quickly how Avro looks like, um, so as I said, you define a schema. Um, so this is how a schema look, looks like. Uh, you just define like some, it's just a JSON schema that's uh, not going to be inside your data, but just uh, needs, you need it to encode your data. Um, so it's a serialization format. Um, so who says serialization says uh, usually hard on CPU, and it's not where uh, Python usually shines. Um, a quick example of Avro data, like if, if you take this, uh, this schema with a quick instance, like in JSON, it could look like, like the first line, and in Avro, it's just, well, bytes. Um, so yeah, uh, quick flash back 2004 when Yelp was founded. It was uh, all Python. Um, now back to, well, f f flash forward to 2018 uh, with the advent like Docker services, etc. cetera. Uh, Yelp is still mostly by, uh, Python, um, but uh, we've seen some services written in Java, some in Go, some, and some in Rust no nowadays. So one of the new use cases you could think about would be, well, you have a user that uh, visits Yelp and it hits some Rust code at some point in the, in the path. Um, and then you need a, like, a Rust library to do data serialization in, uh, using Avro. Uh, you get bad data, magic happens, and you get uh, great reviews for great, great local businesses. Um, so you can see the scheme coming along, like, uh, well, you have some Python code with uh, another library written in Python, or some Rust code, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, good thing about Rust is that, well, Antonio will get you through it a bit uh, later, but it's safe, it's fast, etc. So um, why not, why step just here? Um, why, what if we could get something like this? So yeah, you have a user on Yelp uh, that, um, gets, uh, hits like a Python code. It does data serialization using a Rust library instead, um, which is fast, fast, faster than Python for doing serialization, hopefully. Um, magic happens and then you get great data. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, before we move any further, uh, let's stop for a second and um, what you'll bring home, bring, bring home hopefully by the end of the talk. So first is, well, how to write Rust code in Python packages. Um, why and when would you do that? Um, some Python, C, and Rust facts, and jokes, maybe. Um, so there definitely will be jokes, um, but they might not be worth uh, bringing home. Uh, so without any further uh, wait, uh, I'm going to let Antonio introduce you to the problem. So as Flav said before, uh, from time to time, when we are in production and we're looking at our Python code, uh, we look at the metrics, we look at the application, everything is going fine, but it feels kind of slow, a little bit sluggish. And really, what we want here to do is take in Python from being a snail to be something a little bit faster. If the remote works, great. So the first thing that you should try to do to make your Python code much faster is scaling up or out your application. And that's it, really. End of the talk, we can go home. 99% of the time, this is going to work. Questions? When it's not going to work. Okay, great. We've got a smart one in the audience. Uh, so, from time to time, this is not possible to do because, you know, cost, like if you want to spin up 100 sentences on AWS, it's going to be, you know, a bit of a deal. Uh, or your, I don't know, your company has other options, maybe it takes you know, 10 days to get a server or something like that. So in those cases, you may try to change interpreter. And when I mean change interpreter, I mean using PyPy, what else? Uh, so for the few ones who don't know PyPy, PyPy is uh, another interpreter for Python that is going to optimize uh, your code based on, uh, you know, uh, just-in-time compilation, 
uh, type inference and this kind of stuff, caching, it's very, very good and it should, it should be your second option as soon as you want to speed up your code. Or maybe you can use uh, the first one and the second one together, they work. But in case this is not enough, then it's time for us to bring out the big guns and this is the big gun for Python using the C programming languages. So as you know, uh, Python, the main interpreter is called C Python and is developed in C. Being in C, you can write C extension for it, meaning that you can actually write C code, compile it and make your Python application run the C code seamlessly. So uh, just, you know, just to get a feel on the crowd here, how many people have ever written a C extension? Ooh, wow, nice. How many people like writing C extensions? Yes, you get the hang of it. Um, so nowadays, uh, you'll find a lot of projects and instead of writing C extensions, they use C types or CFFI even better. So C type is a module in the standard library. CFFI is a library instead, also developed by the people who developed PyPy and some others. Uh, basically what you can do with the C types or the CFFI library, it's calling via the ABI, we'll go through it later on, um, functions that have been defined and codified in a C binary. So this way you don't need to, you know, fiddle with all the internals of the C Python interpreter. You can just call these external functions, pass arguments to them and then use the result. And this also works with both C Python and PyPy without much of a difference and good performance for both, why C extension are kinda eh at the moment. And our library, PyAbro RS, actually uses this approach. The third option that you have is using Cyton. Cyton is a compiler for Python and it provides you a superset of the Python language and basically you can write uh, some code and then it's gonna be compiled into C and executed by your application. Uh, Fastavro, the library we are going to compare against, uses this approach instead. One thing to remember about Cyton is that if you want your application to be fast both on PyPy and C Python, you got to kind of duplicate your code because the way you got to write your code is slightly different and PyPy is in experimental support, I believe. Anyway, Fastavro does exactly this. It has two versions of the same code, one for PyPy and one for C Python. So since we're going to use CFFI for our code, uh, let me just, you know, go very, very quickly uh, through it. So this is basically the code that you need to use CFFI in your application. Basically, you need an header file with the declaration of all the symbols that you're going to use and the binary file where, you know, the actual functions are going to, are going to live and the actual structs. And finally, you can call all the functions or the structs via the object that you just created. As I mentioned before, the trick here is using the ABI. ABI stands for Application Binary Interface and it's just a set of rules that can be used to make your Python application or any application really talk with C functions. So basically it's a way to put arguments on the stacks, to read uh, returns from the stack, this kind of stuff. Uh, so basically as the ABI uh, makes your Python application talk to C, how do we make our Rust application being called from Python application? Well, what do we do? It's gonna be disguising Rust as it was C and then we'll make it work. So, at this point of the talk, you may ask, yeah, sure, this all works, but it works in C as well. So why should I bother writing Rust instead of C? Well, if you're at this talk, you probably have, have heard about Rust before, right? Say yes. Node, please. Great. Uh, so, Rust has, you know, very cool features if compared to C. The first one is guaranteed memory safety. Uh, thanks to the ownership, uh, to the ownership paradigm that is encoded in the language and the borrow checker and a couple other stuff, Rust guarantees that you want double free memory, you want access memory that you shouldn't access, this kind of stuff. And if you ever program C, you know that this is fantastic. The second thing is concurrency without data races, again, thanks to the very smart compiler, the Rust has. Third one is zero cost abstraction. Uh, basically, you only pay for the abstraction you use, and these abstractions are actually much better than C, 
you have maps and lists and arrays and everything and they just work. Fourth, model syntax. You have option, result, pattern matching and many more. And, four, and the last one is awesome tooling. Like, I love the tooling, really. Cargo is amazing. If you ever try Cargo, compiling, installing new application, linting, a format, it does everything for you. It's just amazing and just works. Even cross-compilation just works. Now, being this the problem and our approach, I let Flav guide you through the Avro library that we wrote and that is now used as the main uh, Avro serialization and deserialization library for Rust. Thank you. Uh, so, well, let's begin our journey for writing uh, Rust instead of C and embedding in everything in Python. So first, we need well, some Rust code. Um, so first, um, how to write Avro using Rust. So we were looking on, like, well, we did what anybody would do. We were opening Google and Stack Overflow and looking for a library that was doing uh, serialization and deserialization. Uh, we wanted it to support uh, Serde, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know what Serde is, it's a Rust uh, framework for doing well, serialization and, and deserialization of any Rust data structure. So you only have to like uh, implement the serializer and the deserializer, and it gives you code generation and lots of uh, cool features that you don't even need to worry about because it just works. Um, and last, we wanted a library that was well supporting all the the, the, the specification of Avro, uh, which is more complicated than it seems. Um, so yeah, we were looking through all of this, and we couldn't find any any good uh, implementation that was uh, fitting all the the, the, the the parameters so we did like any software engineers will, will do like uh, when they have free time we build our own um, so this is our RS or library that uh, we wrote um, and that does all the things that we mentioned just before uh, very quickly how to use it in using rust um, so this is just a, st a test structure um, the only thing you need to to notice here to note here is uh, these two attributes, deserialize and, ser and serialize. So these are the third day attributes. And that's all you need to be able to, to interact with the library using um, for, for this structure. Um, so third day does all the rest for us, um, which is awesome. Uh, next, uh, I mentioned in the beginning, schema. So this is the way you define a schema, um, just passing in a string, and it returns you like, well, a schema. Um, now, if you want to write data, you need to uh, well have something uh, that can write, so a writer. You give a schema to the writer so that the data fits the schema and something that you can write into. Uh, for the, the purpose of the talk, it's just like a um, vector. It's just this. It's going to be like a byte array. Um, but it's basically anything that you can write into. So it can be a file, it can be a socket, it can be yeah, anything you can write into. Um, create a record. Um, there is, like, this is the automated way to create a record. There's a more manual way to create one, um, like creating a record, putting 27 to A and foo into B. Um, and then you can just append records to the writer and flush it um, in case. So there is like some internal buffering, so um, that's why the flush is, is used. Um, so you have uh, Avro bytes now, so um, now that you have your bytes, you might want to be uh, able to read them and get uh, data structure bytes. So you can create a writer from this, a reader from these bytes um, and iterate over all the records of this reader. And well, that's, that's all you need to know about, um, to worry about. Um, so yeah, that's it so far how to write uh, Avro using Rust. It's pretty straightforward once you have the library. Um, and I'm going to let Antonio guide us through the FFI layer of the, of the presentation. So, how are we doing on coffee so far? You still awake? Good, because we're going to have more code. So, first thing, uh, if you just remember the library that Flav just showed you like 20 seconds ago, there are two things that we need to expose. First one are structs. So we can expose them in two ways. The first one is defining a struct. For example, we define this Avro string over here, which is basically something that we use for passing uh, smart strings instead of using pointers. And you can define all your attributes in Rust using some weird types. If you ever programmed Rust, usually you don't use uh, star, mood, c, char. It's, it's, I mean, these are row pointers. Those are just using these FFI layers for a function interface. That's what the acronym stays for. And in this way, your uh, user, the user of the library, the user of the FFI library actually, is going to be able to access all the attributes of the structs directory. And also, remember to always specify this attribute over here, rep C. This basically makes the Rust compiler actually encode the struct in a way that can be understood by C application. Otherwise, if you don't want your user 
to be able to access all the fields in the structs, you can use opaque handlers. We use it a lot in our application as well, so you just define an handler over here, and then you have your internal struct, and you cast your struct when you return it back to this type. Uh, I'll show you in a second, actually. So the second last thing that we need to expose is basically functions. Well, it, it is pretty easy, but the first time you look at them, so this is called from our library as well, they kind of, you know, they feel a bit intimidating, so let's destructure them. So the, basically, the first thing that they do is just calling functions that are defined in the Rust library. So this one is the first function that Fluff showed you before, is the one parsing a string to get an Avro scheme out of it. So what we do in this function is just, you know, massaging a bit the arguments, in this case, the referencing the JSON pointer, because it's still like a C-like interface, and converting it to a Rust string, and that's it. The second thing we do is doing the same for the result. So what we're doing here is using box, which is basically the Rust uh, correspondence of writing something to the heap instead of the stack, otherwise at the end of the function it will be deallocated. And also here we are actually casting into the opaque handler I showed you before, as you can say, as you can see. So given this, the signature of the function becomes a little bit more clear, so you get a pointer to an Avro string, you return a result with a pointer to an Avro schema. The real magic happens in this macro that we wrote, and it basically wraps all the functions that we wrote in the FFI layer. So if we go inside it, basically this is what happens after the macro gets expanded. You'll get a first attribute on top, which is basically the no-mangle attributes, just saying to the compiler, hey, please don't mangle the name of my function because I want to access it afterwards. And then adding this to the signature, they basically say to Rust, uh, so this is an unsafe function, um, this is going to be called from C code. And finally, basically wrapping the logic that we wrote before into this little util that we called safe unwind. So, unfortunately, when you write FFI layers in Rust, since you are basically dealing with C code on the other end, you have some gotchas that you got to take care of. So the first one, and that's why we wrote that method before, it's unwind and safety. Unfortunately, there is no common way between Rust and C and all the other languages, truth to be told, to unwind the stack when there is a panic. So what we need to do is catching the panic and unwinding the stack in the Rust way so it's clean when the, when the control is given back to the C application calling our library. The second thing are error codes since the, um, the library is actually going to look like a C library, then we need to define error codes and a way for your user to get them. And we need to do explicit memory, man memory management, because yes, the library is pure Rust, but this little thin layer is going to be used by C applications. So we need to be very careful in saying to the user what is managed, what is owned, what they need to free, what they don't need to free. Also, we need to duplicate the nums, because unfortunately Rust is this shortcoming at the moment. Complex arguments are a bit of a pain. For example, Python dictionary, you need to serialize them or transform them in some, some kind of an object and then feed them into your library and many, many more. And this is just, man, this is too much, really. So, you know what the solution to this? What, which one is the solution to this problem? Basically, it's copy-pasting. Go to our library, copy-paste the util function, copy-paste the macro, copy-paste all the util structures, and everything, and you're almost there, 90%. Now, I would like to point you to a decent library instead of copy-pasting, but there is none that I really like, and this is our second project on the FFI layer. So, on the third one, we're probably going to write the library, and then I'm going to point you to that. Uh, the last thing that we need is the header file. So, as we remember for CFFI, we need an header file with the declaration of the symbol, so we can find them in the actual binary. Now, the other file is going to look exactly like all the definitions that I showed you before, but in C syntax. So, char star data, this weird uint ptr underscore t, what is, what is that? I don't even have an idea. Uh, this type def structs and everything, so, and again, this is a pain, code duplication, other syntax. But you know, we have a solution for that too. C bindgen. C bindgen is awesome. 
is a fantastic open source project, you can find it on GitHub. What you need to do is basically just hooking it up in your make file and with just this little command will auto-generate the header file for you. It even transforms the Rust doc strings in comment. It's amazing, trust me. Again, copy paste it and you're done. You don't need to write another file anymore. Uh, now that we know how to FFI Flav, that is our resident Python expert, is going to explain to you how we basically wrap everything into a decent Python library so that the users won't even notice that we are using Rust under the hood. Cool. Uh, so yeah, on the on to the well last step of our journey, uh, Python. So now that we have all the, the CFFI layer and the Rust layer that we don't even need to worry about now because we have well FFI is what we're going to deal with. Uh, the only thing that we have to do is uh, well write C in Python. Um, so yeah, it's not great, um, but that's how it is. So if you, for instance, want to well serialize an integer, you just call the the CFFI function avro value int new and give it an integer, and well that's it. Um, as Antonio said, um, support for complex data structures is not, not really there. So if you want, like, for instance, serialize a Python list, um, then you well create an array, give it, give it a capacity in the beginning, and for each of the items, you manually like append them to, to, to the uh, Avro array, and then you return, re you return it in the end. So yeah, well, just writing C in Python. Um, but Python is a little bit better than C uh, on some some in some cases, um, and well, code readability is one of them. Um, so what we did for our library, uh, which uh, is just an example and could be used anywhere, is just defining a small class and that maps each of the uh, like uh, primitive types that Python has and uh, to a well CFFI function. And depending on the type of the uh, of the value that of the data that you want to serialize, just going to call the the right function. Um, and it's well, uh, if you have like a nested uh, value, like uh, like a dictionary, it's just going to call uh, rec recursively. Um, and all the thing that the, your user needs to worry about is this uh, property in the end, which is uh, value, which is uh, yeah, they, they don't need to worry about anything else. That's uh, just they just use the the value property, and that's all that they are going to see. Um, um, so how would it look like? Um, as a Python end user, so if you have a schema, well, you just define a schema using uh, the, the, the schema as a string. If you want a writer, you create a writer with the schema. If you want to wrap a data, well, you just do it like this. Uh, you flush the data, you get the bytes, you create the reader, and for each of the items, you, you can iterate on them. So it's, well, it's, that's how it looks like for the, the end user. It's just Python code. It could be like written in Python, it could be written in C, it could be written in Rust, it could be written in anything, and it looks like Python. Uh, so yeah, we kind of like it. Um, so now that well, your users can uh, use your library, you need to uh, find a way to well, package the library and distribute it to uh, people that want to use it. Um, first, you need the, the FFI code. Um, so we're just using a git sub module for that. Then uh, every time you have a change into your FFI layer, you need to make sure that you well, compile it all the time. So uh, the, the way we do it is using Cargo, uh, which is a pack of, um, well, with, like the toolbox of Rust, and it does, uh, can do compilation for you. Um, so every time your code changes, you need to make sure that you run this command. Uh, if you want to package the, your Python package, uh, you need you know define setup.py and well um, run the commands and everything. Um, and yeah, so how would the, the setup.py look like in Python? So um, that's pretty much how it would, uh, it would look like. Um, the only things that you need to worry about is this uh, package data. So this is uh, stuff that is not Python that you're going to include as well in your pa package. You need to make sure that you include. Uh, the header that Antonio just mentioned, and also the well, the actual binary, uh, Rust binary. You also need to make sure that zip safe is set to false because um, when you uh, package uh, Python packages uh, that contain data files uh, like binaries, in our case, um, they're not zip safe. You just need to make sure that it's how it is. Um, and last, you need to worry about this uh, BDS will. Uh, so here is just a function that, and it's over complicated for like it's just you need to make sure that you compile it for the right like uh, Python version uh, ABI version the, the correct platform and yeah it's it's a pain uh, you just need to like too many things to worry about um, I don't want that but uh, Milsnake is awesome so Milsnake is an open source tool uh, built by a company called Sentry and what it gives you is basically uh, like it's awesome um, so let's dig into, into this uh, first you 
they give you like you, you, you can specify in serve.py that okay I have an external some, something else that I want to build um, in our case it's just uh, a rest, a rest uh, package it can be like any anything it could be C if you want it could be you know, anything that you need to to, to build um, so in our case you call the comment <coughs> next thing you, we need to worry about is uh, uh, the well, where is the binary? Um, so it's platform independent. You just give it wh where it should be and how it should look like, and that's it. Um, last is uh, well, the header file. So well, this doesn't change, and it just gives you where where the header file is. So in the end, this is how your setup.py would look like. Um, the only thing you need to to worry about is adding this, and that's it. You can just build your Python package. It's going to call the rest uh, compilation, and in the end, uh, your gonna have your Python package. Um, so yeah, trust me, Milksnake is awesome. Um, so yeah, now now you get a Python package uh, that runs Rust code, um, but in the end, like, was it really worth it? Was it really faster? What, why bother? Uh, so I'm gonna let Antonio get it for you. All right, all right. Since we're basically all scientists, engineers, this should be the best part of the talk for us. Numbers, charts, graphs. Let's start. So this is just a random benchmark. I mean, not really a random one. It's a pretty good one for us, but shh. Um, basically, don't focus too much on the numbers. This is just some, you know, encoding and decoding of Avro messages. It's seconds on the left, so the shorter the best. And we can find that our code performs decently well, both on C, Python, and PyPy. You can see the gets optimized on PyPy for writes, not much for reads, but you know, you get some optimization on PyPy as well, so it works fine. Let's compare it with FastAvro, which is the library using Cyton instead of Rust extensions, or we do. So as you can see, like sometimes they're faster, sometimes they're faster, but we're more or less there. Like they are comparable. This means that our approach using Rust extensions is comparable to Cyton, which is basically, I would say, the state of the art for making uh, C code running into your Python application. Now this is very important. We actually, for example, um, deliver much better performances on reads. Who knows why, actually, but we do. And now, just for the sake of it, let's compare both FastAvro and PyAvro RS against the pure Python Avro library, the one maintained by Apache. Uh, I'm going to change the scale so it helps you out understanding what's going on. This is the scale. Now, as you can see, on uh, CPython the gains are real. On PyPy, the gains are still real, like less than half or whatever. But, as you can see, PyPy really optimizes very well your Python code. That's why, before embarking in this very fun journey of writing Rust, exposing that as the F FFI, writing a Python wrapper and everything, or writing C Python, or writing Cyton, just try to change the interpreter. Really, do it for me, do it for yourself. And, um, okay, before to close, actually, I'm sure that, you know, inside you, you really, really, really want to know, but, I know it's a different language, but, how much faster was just the Avro library, the Rust library? Well, it's the red column. Yes. Um, so I'll change the scale again. I'll compare it against only our library. And this is the green column. Yes. Rust is fast. Very fast. As fast as C, basically. To conclude, Last part of the talk, since we promised in the title, how to get away with it, which is basically answering to two questions. First one, how to convince my colleagues? Well, Rust is the most language, the most loved language in the Stack Overflow survey for I don't remember even how many years in a row. And if so many people love Rust, there must be a reason. Second, compilation just works. Again, Cargo is awesome. It just works. Cross-compilation just works. You ever heard of that? Uh, fast recycle. The recycle of Rust is only six weeks, if I remember correctly, so you don't need to wait years to see your uh, favorite feature landing in at least the nightly build. 
and it's a ton of fun, otherwise me and Flav wouldn't be here. Second question, the most important actually, how to convince my company? Because, you know, they kind of pay the bills. So, first one is wheels. Compile once, install everywhere. Well, given the platform. So, in our company at Yelp, what we do for uh, distributing these kind of packages is basically building a Python wheel somewhere in Docker, on Jenkins machines, somewhere, and then installing them on uh, the same platform in production without even requiring a cargo installation or Rust compiler. You don't need to compile any code if you already packaged the build for the right platform. Second is FFI interoperability. And this is a plus that only comes with the C-type CFFI uh, option. So if you write a Rust, a Rust library and then you package it in FFI, then it's accessible to basically all the languages in the world. Java via by a GNI or GNA, Objective-C, C++. Actually, at Yelp we have another project where we have uh, some Rust code that is shipped to our website, that is Python, our Android application and our iOS application via the same mechanism. Rust is as fast as C, which means it's cheap to run, some gains over here, and it's safer than C, so it's cheap to maintain, so you know, other gains for your company. And finally, it's used in production by many companies, Yelp, Mozilla, Dropbox, and many, many others, probably bigger than yours. So, why not try it out? So again, what to bring home? Right, Trust in Server C. Well, it was easy, it was the title. C Bindgen is awesome, remember that. Milk Snake is awesome, remember that as well. And those are the links for the copy-pasting. So, uh, remember that we are hiring uh, both London and Hamburg, but instead of going through, you know, the usual uh, shameless uh, hiring plug, uh, I'm going to tell a story here. So basically, uh, I think it was four months ago, three months ago, uh, I was pretty pissed off, was drinking a coffee with Flav, and I was working on the other project, the other Rust project, and I was like, oh man, I really have a couple cool features that I want to implement, but you know, there is no good uh, Avro library in Rust, so I guess we're just gonna drop it and wait for someone to implement it. And Flo was like, ah, I see, ah, 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 poor you, poor thing. Then after a couple months, uh, again, uh, drinking coffee, because we, lo we do love coffee, uh, Flo comes up to me and say, oh, uh, by the way, I've written the library you, you needed, you wanna try it out? And so, if you want to work with these awesome colleagues that do your job for you, uh, then come to Yelp. <laughs> Follow us on any social network too. Talk. Questions. Uh, let's be inside that. So, any question? Yeah, we have time for many questions. All right, so I don't know how it works for the microphones over here, so... Uh, just shout your question. Okay, just talk normally and we're going to repeat it. Yes. Let's do that. <laughs> sure. So I wonder how you do distribution, uh, or do you do distribution of binary uh, packages like wheel format or uh, do you do sort of distributions? Uh, no, we just do distribution of uh, wheels, as I said, so we have basically what we usually do for this kind of libraries, we have a Jenkins pipeline and uh, we do have uh, different Docker containers for the various platforms we are building and every Docker container installs the right dependencies, you build a wheel, uh, then we basically upload the wheel to our internal pipe and the users can just install the wheel. In you have not question. Correct. Um, so, the question was, how do you do the distribution of these packages? Uh, do you use Python wheels? Do you use something else? You distribute the source, this kind of stuff. Thank you very much again. Um, and so, and that before was the answer. <laughs> Is that okay? Or uh, does he answer the question? Yes, and uh, what about macOS? We do not, so, yes, what about macOS? Uh, we do not ship any macOS code, we just have our uh, iOS library and uh, for that one, I don't know, I'm not in the iOS team actually. You know what? Mac Pros. Just Mac Pros that people... Yeah, you just speak. 
We just have some Mac pros that build the, the thing for Mac. Next. Okay, I, I'll just go in order. Oh, we have a mic, great. Uh, just to complete the previous question, uh, do you have an external dependency when you build a binary library uh, in REST? Uh, I mean, you could, and yes. In your, in your case, do you do you depend on something? Or no, no. Is it we, a standalone? Uh, yeah, yeah. We just we just use the standard Rust. And just we don't have any dependency. Uh, really, this is just uh, an encoding and decoding uh, protocol. So it's CPU intensive, a lot of bytes going up and down, but no more than that. Uh, for the other project instead, actually, we have external dependency. Uh, SSL and I don't remember what else. Uh, what we usually do uh, is basically installing them into well the machine or actually in Docker if it's running Docker. But uh, they're not. They're just you know uh, dependency installed at the operating system level. We don't package it with the with the file. Thank you very much for uh, sharing this uh, very detailed journey. That was very insightful. Um, but um, the FFI part seemed uh, to be very painful. Now, I'm just curious, why did you do this uh, whole CFI thing, uh, FFI thing yourself, as opposed to using one of the libraries like uh, PyO3 or uh, Rust C Python that would do this for you? That's a very, very good question, actually. So, uh, but let's take PyO3, for example. So, for anyone who doesn't know, PyO3, what it does is basically uh, make it possible to call Python from Rust and Rust from Python. Uh, and it's very, very similar to the C extension syntax. Um, so, in, you can use it. It's going to work. It's going to actually maybe be even faster uh, than our library. Uh, but the only problem is that if you use PyO3 or this kind of, um, of libraries, then you are bound to Python. Instead, with this approach, you can use your FFI package layer in any other language if you want to build a wrapper for that. And in a company like Yelp, where we are actually supporting a lot of languages, even if Python is our main one, this is a very good pro. And as Flav showed at the very beginning, instead of having um, you know, different implementation of Avros in many languages, they can come with different quirks. We just have one, and everything gets encoded and decoded with the same application. So. I guess that's a good pro. But yeah, it was a very good, very good question. And uh, there is also another talk about Pio3. I don't yeah, remember I which day. Me, so. Okay, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, 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 there was a bit, there was, there was, you know, one of the shady advertisements over there. But anyway, good. go to the talk. <laughs> Any other question? We are free. Yep. Yeah, you mentioned that um, you would uh, write a generalized library for the FFI layer for Rust uh, when you are, if you were doing a project or, or, or two in the future. So when can we expect that? Flav, how much free time do you have? <laughs> Too much. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So, do you have the same code base uh, for working with Python 2 and 3, or some difference between? Them? Very good question. It's exactly the same. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, we're gonna get the microphone back to the to the front at the end. Sorry. Uh, from what I have seen, like in the beginning of the talk, uh, you were using the CFFI's ABI mode, right? Yes. And according to the CFFI project, uh, I mean, at least taking the documentation, it seems like to be the one which is more problematic and also the slowest one compared to the API mode. Uh, yes. Did you experiment like with something like generating a C bridge, which will compile into an extension uh, so to have some no. gains? To be fair, no. <laughs> okay, because I mean, from my experience, it seems like that for small functions, I mean, uh, the cost of calling it is much higher than, for example, the time of execution of the function itself. So for this ABI mode, I mean, uh, you have like the advantage of genericity, so it works like for, for many languages and not only Python, but especially in Windows, it's kind of very problematic if you have like different tool chains compiled with 
GCC or MSPC and I mean your code which is just ship it with the shared object library I mean on Windows for example could not work that easily uh, yes you're correct to be fair we don't target Windows as well at Yelp so and I don't own a Windows machine so I guess I, I, I don't really know but I will try that out why not How embedded is Rust at your organization? And I mean, when you decided to use Rust for this project, I should imagine you already would have had a lot of C++ programmers and perhaps experience in C++. Didn't you face a bit of an uphill struggle? Trying to I, I, I let Flav answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Um, I don't think we have that many C++ no, programmers at okay. Yelp. Uh, or I mean, at least they don't show it and they, uh, yeah. Um. So just just the Rust and that was fine. I, I guess so. Um, I mean, we didn't have any, like, uh, we just came in with something that was fast and people were happy about okay. it, so. Um, okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have quite similar question, but more specific uh, about learning curve of Rust and uh, how much do you like Borrow Checker? <laughs> I love it when my code complies. Um, <laughs> Uh, all the other time, I, yeah, I, well, yeah, it's just smarter than me and I don't like it. Um, but, I mean, uh, the learning curve of Rust for, like, I tried Rust maybe three years ago and I didn't like it, it was too hard for me, and then I came back six, eight months uh, um, ago, and it's, it's, like, it's fine. Um, you just need to take the time and it's, like, all the, the documentation, all the tooling, all the community, everything is, is great, so you have all the tools to, to be able to, to let us succeed in writing Rust code. Thanks. I think we're done. Um, yes. So, if you have any other question or you just want to offer us a coffee because they're free, uh, just come and talk to us directly. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.